This is a video explanation of chapter 26. Again, just a reminder that all the images within this PowerPoint presentation, this video presentation, are in the public domain. Um, again, we're going to be covering years 1865 to 1896, kind of looking over um, this Great West and the Agricultural Revolution from 1865 to 1896, shortly after the Civil War and everybody's movement to the West. Um, so please don't hesitate to give me an email or call if you have any questions. Thank you. As we begin Chapter 26, we're going to introduce Frederick Jackson Turner into the mix. Frederick Jackson Turner, author, historian, who in 1893, after looking at the United States Census, came to a conclusion that um, there is no more a frontier existing in the Wild West. And then he went on to define this frontier as this meeting point between savagery and civilization. And so as we uh, look at chapter 26, we're going to look at not only um, cowboys, Indians, we'll also look at the railroad, the buffalo, and uh, the Wild West when it comes to cattle trails. And then we'll also get into the homesteaders and farmers as they're trying to settle and subdue this land from sea to shining sea and extinguish this meeting point between savagery and civilization that Frederick Jackson Turner says no longer exists. And he says this in 1893. So we'll begin chapter 26. We'll start off with the Great Plains culture and the Great West and embracing mountains, plateaus, deserts, and plains. The Great West was the habitat of the Indian, the buffalo, the wild horse, the prairie dog, and the coyote. Twenty-five years later, by 1890, the entire domain had been carved into states and four territories. And so the Native Americans numbering 360,000 in 1860, right after the Civil War, or even during the Civil War, um, greatly reduced in number 30 years later, by 1890. And a big portion of this was due to soldiers spreading cholera, typhoid, and smallpox with devastating results. We hear about the various Indian battles but most of the Indians were devastated by disease spread by the white man. Buffalo Hunt by famous American artist Frederick Remington, 1890. These are other images of the Wild West, the cowboy and then also the Great Plains. Eventually it becomes um, noticeable that the United States government's strategy is to kind of carve the Great Plains into two, um, kind of cordoning off um, American Indians up to the north and then also down to the south. So Oklahoma and then south and north Dakota with Kansas and Nebraska eventually being the place for the homesteaders, the Transcontinental Railroad, and other um, settlements coming through, and that is to isolate, sending the Great Sioux um, Indian tribe up to the Dakota, and then also sending other Indians down to Oklahoma. If you ever have a chance to read more about the Sand Creek Massacre, Massacre in 1864, we'll look at 1864 and Colonel Shivington out in Sand Creek, Colorado. Um, there's a great chapter written in uh, the book Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Um, if you ever have a chance to read that book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. And um, there's a chapter about the horrific atrocities committed by the American soldiers towards the Indians. Um, but the Indian War is beginning in 1864 with Sand Creek Massacre. 
And of course, another very famous Indian battle was the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's Last Stand. Again, another handout that you could read, or another other numerous books that you can read about the details of Custer's Last Stand. This is, of course, then the Indian painting. Um, looking at the American soldiers being massacred by the great Indian troops. But uh, Custer did not survive. Um, don't have time in this chapter to look specifically at this battle. But suffice to say, it would be well worth your time to, to take a look more specifically at this. Very short summary of this battle, Custer's Last Stand, is probably best described by using a, a map. And so, um, Custer and his men were divided into three groups. Reno was placed here, and Benteen was placed here, and they were to be kind of as a diversion, or at least to draw attention by Crazy Horse and the Sioux encampment, while um, Custer and his group went around with an envelopment and potentially outflanking the whole encampment crossing the river and then hopefully the idea was to come in from the back side however because of crazy horse and his leadership they the, the initial um, attack by Benteen and Reno was stopped was halted and they did not pursue they did not pursue the Indians stayed on their side of the river and sensed that there was maybe something else going on and so they set up a line here and then Crazy Horse went and he went around up and around eventually then as Custer is making his approach and comes in realizing that something is wrong turns around and finds that he is then of course surrounded by the Indians so Take, a t take some time to read more about Custer's Last Stand. So some of the more famous Native American Indians of this time, you have, of course, Sitting Bull, the Sioux Chief. Um, we have the Apache Chief, Geronimo. We have Chief of the Nez Perce Indian Tribe, Chief Joseph. His famous quote, I will fight no more forever. And then Chief Bigfoot. So the last major Indian battle occurs at the site of Wounded Knee. This is a famous photograph of Bigfoot as he is left, his corpse is left on the battleground because it becomes very cold and snowy. The, the soldiers go back to this battle scene this ba um, a day or two later and discover his body frozen into his uh, dying kind of shape. So this is a very famous Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, Wounded Knee Battle. And uh, it's kind of the last battle. This is 1890. First battle occurs more or less the Battle of Shivington, Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, and this is one of the last major ones in 1890. One of the ways in which the Americans were able to put the Indians in a, kind of a disadvantage was to take the buffalo and eliminate the buffalo. The buffalo was the chief source of supplies for the Indians and then you had the Buffalo Bill William Cody who killed over 4,000 of these animals in 18 months as he was employed by the Kansas Pacific Railroad as you watch some of the video clips from this chapter you'll learn more about the railroad um, but the railroad was the taming of the Indians was engineered by a number of factors. The cardinal importance fact, the most, one of the most important factors, was the railroad, which shot an iron through the heart, of, an iron arrow through the heart of the West. And this building of the transcontinental railroad, um, connecting basically the East to the West, 
or at least connecting the east to California, ran principally from um, Omaha, Nebraska, up to Promontory Point in Utah, and then also from California or Sacramento to Promontory Point, meeting north of Salt Lake City. The railroad was instrumental in bringing then settlers to America as the railroad was given land by the United States government as incentive to build the railroad and then that land was to be sold. These kind of advertisements were spread throughout all of Europe, throughout all the world, advertising the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific land for sale very very cheap land to encourage America uh, encourage settlers from around the world to travel to the United States very good book written by Stephen Ambrose nothing like it in the world describes the building of this transcontinental railroad several other very instrumental books written about this time uh, D Brown I mentioned earlier bury my heart at wounded knee D Brown um, Sarah Winnemucca, Life Among the Paiutes, and Helen Hunt Jackson, A Century of Dishonor. Most of these books are written about the, um, the Indian um, experience during this time, um, but then there's other books written coming at the angle of the Transcontinental Railroad and also the Cattle Drives, Buffalo, mineral discoveries, so on and so forth. Last slide in this presentation, part one for chapter 26, is the end of the trail for the Indians, the Dawes Act of 1887. Again, Frederick Jackson Turner describes the end of the frontier occurring in 1890. So in 1887, um, this forced civilization of the Indians trying to dissolve tribes and tribal ownership of land and set up individual family heads and to try to reward them with 160 acres and settle them down onto a specific piece of property so they aren't quite as nomadic and then this quote of course if if the Indians would behave themselves like good white settlers, they would get full title to their holdings as well as citizenship, but they'd have to wait. They'd have to wait for it for 25 years. Um, so the Dawes Act, I don't think, was very popular among Indians. Um, so that concludes Chapter 26, Part 1, Presentation. And uh, again, all the images within this presentation are in the public domain, and we will continue with part two of chapter 26.